Hello, and welcome to Surrogate to the Abyss. I'm your host, Richard Gerlach. With me, as always, is Matt Brandenburg. We are back from the past, coming to the future. <laughs> and tagging <laughs> along for with a while. us is... We have been gone for a while. Two weeks. And tagging along with us is Vitlame Mist. I just had this little young... I just found this little toy pointy that I used to have when I was a kid, and now I just can't... It can't leave my side. I love it. <laughs> That's not a good. That's not some a good thing. And with us is special guest, the author of *The Haunting of Velkwood*, Gwendolyn Keist. Hello, thank you so much for having me. Well, thank you. Thank you for joining back. us. I was trying to think. This is what maybe your third time back. Yeah, I think I so. Think yeah. yeah, I think it's your third time here. Yeah, which is pretty awesome. You're, you're, you're yeah, <laughs> you're up there with Matt Wilson. I think <laughs> <laughs> maybe Chad Lutsky. I think we've had them on a couple of times. I think I think Matt Wilderson has our most spots for a guest. <laughs> <laughs> that crazy guy. Yeah, I'd say you're up here. Uh, you're up here with Chad Lutsky. Um, yeah, but we've no, had Chad is, on quite a bit. Yeah, <laughs> this was an awesome book. I'm so excited to be able to talk about it. Thank yeah, you so it was, much. It was really fantastic. It's available everywhere. No. Um, it's a really really great book. It is, I don't know, I feel like, no, no, I like the whole concept of it too. We'll dive into it a bit more when we get into the podcast, but instead of just like a haunted house, the whole like haunted neighborhood under a veal thing was just such a cool concept that like I was pulled in almost immediately. Well, good. That's, I mean, that's like what every author wants to hear. It's like, <laughs> I love your execution and I love your concept. So yes, thank you. <laughs> We're starting out well. <laughs> we're, 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 we're on track. <laughs> oh my god, I love it. <laughs> oh, oh, it's, uh, it's it's good stuff. Are you, are you ready to join on the praise of it, Lame? <laughs> oh yeah. I mean, I kind of want to save it when we start talking about it because I All have right. a couple of comps that I like like to compare it to because they gave me such good vibes that yeah, I want to save it. Right. But I did yeah, enjoy I actually, it a lot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I want to see the deeper discussion before we get into it. But just right now for audience, just to let us let them know, it is a great book. It's available everywhere. And yeah, I'm I'm excited to see the traction that it gets because I honestly really, really enjoyed this one. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> 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 but before we dive into the book itself, we'd like to kind of give a rundown of some things that we've watched in the last week. And it's been about, what, two weeks is our last podcast? Yeah, man. So we'll do our best to try to keep this light <laughs> and <laughs> not not bombard it with media consumption. But I will say, <laughs> uh, the one... So I make a habit of seeing... Every single Oscar nominated movie, like during the year, like I try to see as many movies as I can. And like, I know awards are kind of bullshit anyway, but like, I don't know. I always like to see the ones that are winning and be like, which one do I think deserves to win versus which one actually won? Yeah. Mm. And and this year I had seen them all, but poor things and poor <laughs> things finally came to Hulu. And what'd you think? And I loved it. It was it, it was such a I, I thought it was a really great movie. Is it gonna win? No, it's not gonna win. <laughs> um, <laughs> I I will say I'll put it in my for me personally, it's in my top three for last year. Um, my favorite being American Fiction. I think American Fiction was the best movie released last year, personally speaking. But yeah. um I thought this was a really great kind of coming of age slash exploration of a woman's independence slash sex comedy that like it's <laughs> a great myth. there's a lot there's a lot of sex in, in this movie um <laughs> but it's really funny and like i can't pronounce the director's name because it's a greek name and i always have trouble pronouncing them but i think it's like yorgos Lathimos. i think his name is yeah i, I probably butchered it but um He's such like a visually interesting director and it's been interesting watching his movies kind of get more and more surreal in their presentation versus 
them just being odd in their plot, if that makes sense. Yes. What else? What else has he done? Uh, he did Killing of a Sacred Deer. Okay. Um, he did The Lobster. Oh, uh, this. Okay. Yep. Yeah, I know what you're talking about. He also did. He also did the movie that that ruined my um my first serious relationship, which was Dogtooth. Always, <laughs> always remember him for that. <laughs> That's nice. You know what? In my defense, I had no idea what Dogtooth was about when I rented it. Just gonna, oh. just gonna put it that way. Uh. All I, all I had known was it won the best foreign picture Oscar. <laughs> I see. So how did it ruin your relationship? I have to ask. Was she just because like, it is a very screwed up. It's a very screwed up movie, and I didn't expect it to be about a commandeering father who is actively abusing his children mm-hmm. while his children enter an incestuous relationship. Wow. <laughs> so your your partner was angry at you over it. Is that what happened? Yes, I lost. I lost movie renting privileges for the rest of that relationship. <laughs> And she got very mad at me over that movie. And it began kind of the beginning of the downfall of our relationship. Oh so I kind of jokingly blamed that movie for ruining that relationship. I mean, odds are it was going to fall apart anyway. But yeah. I look at that movie as like the beginning, the beginning of the end of it. Because it's kind of funny to see it that way. Yeah, I mean, if, if running a movie that somebody doesn't like is like the beginning of the end of a relationship, it's probably for the best. Yeah. I mean, you know, my husband and I have been together almost 20 years now. And we've definitely each recommended a movie at some point that the other one really didn't like. So I, I yeah. feel like that you got to be able to wet those storms in a relationship. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I also feel like that movie for me, too, was one of those movies where I'm like, that was really fucked up, and I kind of want to see more like this. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, th- but, those um, moments are always fun when it's really silent and tense while the movie's on, and you're just like, I'm sorry, I didn't know this was happening. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, you can pick the next five movies. I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I will say Poor Things, I think, is a really great movie. If you haven't really heard, you might have heard of it, but like it's with Emma Stone, a Willem Dafoe, Mark Ruffalo, and a few others. But the premise is pretty much like Emma Stone plays this woman who had committed suicide while she was pregnant. And Willem Dafoe is like a surgeon who is very like disformed from surgeries his father practiced on him when he was a child. And he comes across this body with a, with a fetus inside and he decides to transplant the fetus's brain into the adult's brain and revive the body. And it brings her back to life in like a childhood state. And the movie is just kind of her growing up essentially as the mind matures and develops along with her. Um, And it is, it's very funny. The set design is gorgeous mm-hmm. and it's a very odd and surreal movie. <laughs> but like the, the comedy, the comedy stays the forefront for like most, most of the movie. And uh, Wilm Dafoe and Emma Stone are both fantastic in it. <laughs> very cool. So that's, that's, that's one I'd recommend. I have a couple more, but I think we should kind of go the rounds to keep it moving. So Matt, what about you? Yeah, so I think uh, first one I kind of want to talk about is The Crimson Labyrinth by Yusuke Kishi. This, um, oh, oh, dude, I read that book years ago. That's so yeah. fucking good. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I was trying to remember, like, because it, it, I guess Yusuke, he's he's a big horror author over in Japan. This, I don't yeah. know, semi recent translation to America. Um, I think this might be the first I mean, one he's. He's so had Crimson in the Ra- Labyrinth was first translated, I think maybe twelve years yeah. ago. Unless there's yeah. a new translation. No, I mean it's probably that one. But um, so anyway, it oh, it's I, the same it, cover it, and everything. <laughs> yeah, it's great. So Crimson Labyrinth, basically, I mean, like the boiling it down, it's kind of like a um, battle royale, you know, whatever the Squid Game kind of thing. It, it's it, basically just 
these people playing a game like unaware that they're playing a game kind of at first though it quickly turns into them knowing they're playing some game and it's like a kill or be killed game the cats but like so that, that that's that, that's a basic idea but like you you kind of get it's like nine nine people uh they all have basically they have game boys and they get little cartridges that that give them directions when they get to certain checkpoints and you're you're not quite sure what's happening at first it feels like they're on mars because i think even the game little game boy tells them they're like on it's like the mars labyrinth but like they they feel like through means and not spoiling they find out they're in australia they're in a place in australia but it's a big rocky dry area and, and it's all nature and it just um, them at first it's just them going to these checkpoints and then it, it like then they realize oh well they have to be the last one to survive to win money and we're following a two two characters as they kind of go through and they they take one path that gives them what they uh, uh, secret information basically kind of give them behind the scenes and at the same time they pick up like a choose your own adventure book called the mars labyrinth and it it, it sort of helps them like it gives you know it's like it was written in the 80s but the time frame of the book we're reading is kind of now current time so like some of the stuff doesn't tie together but it's a really interesting idea of like them looking through this this choose your own adventure book and it's kind of showing them like hey these are things that happen at the same time the game boy is giving them information and you sort of like at, with these types of books you're always kind of at least for me you're, you're like the trope of all oh, society breakdown and these people all revert back to like you know, evil selves and, and, and are all out for themselves and they want to kill everyone else. That's kind of a trope that like after a while you've seen it before and you're like, oh, I get it. It's not anything new. This one, they kind of skip over that, which is nice. And instead this people doing this game, like kind of make two people crazy, like kind of poison them. And again, that's not a spoiler. It happens pretty quick in the thing. And so these two that are poisoned kind of basically turn into cannibals. And so you're running, they're running around hunting everybody down while everyone else is trying to figure out what to do. And then there, there's other stuff in it. Anyway, it's great. Like I <laughs> like halfway through when you get to this description of what happened to these two cannibal people, like physically like makes you like how they transformed and what transformed them. Like it really like gets to you, <laughs> at least to me. And I was just like, oh, that's great. And then like what's happening on this little game boy cartridge at points is actually kind of disturbing too and it's funny because like now that mickey mouse or at least steamboat willie is in the public domain like we're gonna see a lot more of that in this book they talk about the game boy cartridge using a donald duck type character and a mickey mouse type character to show all these like horrible things happening and, and so it, it's just for me i kind of laugh because i was like oh that's funny he kind of saw where things were going and he's going to use them now and like they're not mickey mouse and not donald duck but they he the author writes that like oh they look sort of like uh, enough that you know it's them and that this person that put this game out like knew what they were doing to get in trouble anyway it's fantastic uh i enjoyed it it ends on such an interesting note it, it, that's totally different than anything that we've seen before for these types of stories so Definitely worth checking out the Crimson Labyrinth if you can find it. Awesome. Yeah, it's 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 a really interesting book. I got it back a long time ago when I was still in college. <laughs> but um <laughs> no, it's it's a really it's a really wild book. Like I, I liked it a lot. Yeah, I enjoyed so it. So it's a good I, it's a good recommend. Thanks. And Vitlame, what about you? Uh I have more Baldur's this... Gate adventures. <laughs> <laughs> I I mean, of course, I, I think I'm never going to stop playing that game. <laughs> um, but no, well, I, while I'm still playing it, I, I am also reading and I'm also watching some other stuff. <laughs> I, I am not as consumed by it as I was. <laughs> says Honestly, the lying person in Earth. I, under, I understand the consumption it had on you after like yep. the last couple of weeks I've had with that game. Mm -hmm. So, like, I, I understand, but <laughs> you go. Yeah, yeah, it is. Um, but I I have started listening to the book that I mentioned last time. Uh, it's called I Feed Her to the Beast and the Beast is Me by Jamison Shea. 
And uh, what my premise was when I was reading about the blurb, it was basically like the black swan meets cosmic horror. <laughs> Nice. Uh, so it's about like um, the only black girl in like a ballet academy and she is really trying really hard to become the prima I think it's called in ballerina terms mm -hmm. a lot of there are a lot of ballerina terms in this in this book and I'm like and a lot of things in French and I'm like I can't remember much of my high school French <laughs> <laughs> but it's interesting though but yeah she's really she's trying to become uh, she, I think she becomes a prima in the end but she doesn't get the respect that like all primas usually get when they get that role because she's black mm -hmm. and um, so she's facing all these struggles because of her race and um, then suddenly she gets this opportunity to basically get all the power that she wants in exchange for offering her soul to some kind of cosmic entity. And nice. I'm I'm just at that part right now. And I'm like, the way the um, Crystalline Lloyd, she's the one who's the narrator, the way she changes her voice to the entity, it gave me chills. <laughs> she, like, she really changed her voice to make it sound like she was actually speaking to a horrifying cosmic entity. That is awesome. Nice. So yeah, I'm only like I think I still have like six hours left of the story, but it's really interesting so far. And I'm really, I really want to know what like now that she's getting the, this kind of power, like what is she gonna do with it? I'm pretty sure because she she has all that pent up anger inside her that she's not gonna use it for good. <laughs> She's well, gonna hurt. Not. She's gonna. She's probably gonna like dismember a lot of her competitors just to get ahead. <laughs> I, 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 would, I can see that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Me too. I, honestly, and honestly, I would not blame her for it. I'm like, yeah, girl, you do it. <laughs> you do you. You do yeah, you. You do you, boo. And I'll you just let you. me be. At, just let me be at the front seat and just leave me be. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that's amazing. Wait, um, what was it called again? I feed her to the beast and the beast is me. That's okay, beautiful. Perfect. I love that title. That title looks, is gorgeous. Yeah, it's a great title. Mm -hmm. I looked and, it up on Amazon. Looks like there's a series. Like, is a yes. sequel coming out or it might yes. be already out? Yes, the sequel will come out in in August. Nice. Oh, nice. Yeah. That's why I was so excited. So like, okay. To forward to. Yeah. Is this their first book? I think. Hmm. I mean, I guess I could look it up, but I just figured I'd ask. And I think so. That's awesome. All right. Oh, oops. Perfect. Yeah. And I, Gwendolyn, I think what about right. you? Oh, sorry. No, it's fine. Uh, Gwendolyn, what about you? We can talk about we can talk about TV, right? Oh yeah. 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 You know, I've been watching. It's not horror yet. I still think there's like an existential dread of it. Um, the new feud. Uh, Capote versus the Swans, which I've just oh, been yeah. like, it's very interesting because like it's like this combination of like you know, rich terrible people and li like the literary world and you know this kind of interesting mid century Americana. So that's been really that's been really interesting. I haven't always loved every episode, but they've definitely all been interesting and they've been keeping my attention. And I loved this last week's episode. It was directed by Jennifer Lynch. Who's David nice. Lynch's daughter? Oh, nice. Who did who yeah. did Boxing Helena many years ago? And anybody who follows me on Facebook knows that like I haven't seen Boxing Helena because it's out of print, and I keep waiting for it to maybe like come back into print <laughs> or stream or something. Eventually, I'm probably just going to buy like a a bad DVD transfer on Amazon <laughs> or something. But like you know, I I think that she was treated pretty badly in the '90s when that movie came out and was pretty maligned. And so I'm happy that she's like had this kind of like second career doing some tv uh directing and so i was excited about i loved the first feud with uh uh betty davis and joan crawford yeah. that one was really fun yeah. and i i love like cinema history and everything and you know so i was excited about this anyways and then seeing that jennifer lynch was directing an episode i was even more excited so <laughs> my husband and i have been watching that for the last few weeks because it's almost done now but that's been fun it's again it's not horror but there's definitely like a lot of existential dread in it you know just kind of the rules yeah. of 
be of living and having to be this very rigid life in order to sort of conform to so-called high society and yeah I always love shows that make me be like yeah the rich are terrible like just reinforcing that pre-existing belief like I already have that belief system but then you see this thing like yeah the rich are terrible wow I I honestly love that (laughs) yeah like so like it's like the same with the when you're watching the you series by Caroline Kepnes and yeah yes it's like you were always like, okay, I'm not supposed to be rooting for the freaking stupid ass serial killer, but the way he speaks about the rich, I I wipe with that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Did you ever see um Jennifer Lynch's movie Surveillance? I haven't. No, I need to. I that one's still available more widely, I think, right? Than Box yeah. and Helena. Sur- yeah. Surveillance is really good. Like I, I recommend okay. surveillance. I honestly haven't seen Boxing Helena, but I okay. did see that it, apparently it won the Golden Raspberry Award, mm. which I find interesting because Criterion Films just put a bunch of Raspberry Award yes. winning movies on their streaming yeah. service to get people to revisit them, being like maybe these weren't as bad as everyone was saying they were. <laughs> it's worth yeah. a second yeah. viewing of these. I haven't gone through that collection yet because that one just came out like a week ago. And I love the Criterion channel. That's like where I get so I, I yeah, I wish they would have brought Boxing Helena into that because they like had Showgirls and Gili, and I think yep. Cruising is part of that. And I th- I've seen all of, of those ones. But yeah, <laughs> Cruising is a horror movie, even by the director yeah. of The Exorcist. Yeah. <laughs> Honestly, Cruising, I think, is a really, I don't get why everyone hated that movie. I thought it was really good. But you know, I think that was yeah, because I'm we'll probably talk about this when we, we come to the book because Haunting of Velkwood is a queer book. And I'd always heard that yeah. cruising was so anti, you know, the queer community. And so I really braced myself before I watched it. And I'm like, you know, it's it's I've definitely seen much more, much more homophobic movies than that. It just it feels to me just like a slasher movie. You know, yeah, there's going to be yeah, a group of people that are going to be preyed upon. A lot of times it's college co-eds or campers in Camp Crystal Lake. And in this case, it's, you know, it's San Francisco, right? I think it's San Francisco in, in like the yeah. early 80s. I think it's San Francisco. Now, I'm not sure. It was either San Francisco or New York. I think it's San Francisco. I, was I forget. State, it was, it's, either, it's either one of those two. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a big city that had a very, a very vibrant uh, queer community and a queer nightlife. And, you know, that that's, you know, I don't know. It was it it was very different than I was expecting. I went into it really braced to be deeply offended. And then I was like, it's a slasher movie. I think maybe the people <laughs> who didn't like it just wouldn't like slashers either. And so I yeah. think that that was maybe where where that was coming from at the time. I don't know. And also we have better media representation for queer characters now. I imagine yeah. that like that was like yeah. 40 years ago when you have no representation at all. And then there then it's a slasher movie. It is. It is more upsetting. I think now we come to it from a different perspective of there's so much more representation, not enough representation, obviously, but a lot more that it's easier to be like, you know, if there is. I think that it, it's just different now. So, yeah, no, that makes sense. Yeah, no, I, I, I agree with that. Building on the whole fuck the rich thing that Vitlame brought up. Yeah. Again, not, not 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 horror, but I would say it's horrifying. <laughs> There's a new documentary or docu series on Netflix called The okay. Program. Has anyone heard about this yet? I think no. I have. So you know the whole troubled teen industry thing? Yeah. Mm, yeah. Where like these these parents hire these companies to, to kidnap go, their to, children and send to them go to like a like, boarding school. Oh, is it yeah. not like the it's not the wilderness program? No, but that the wilderness program is part of that actually. Okay. Yeah. Um, in this one, in this one, what it is is like the place is closed now, but it was a location in New York called the Academy at Oak Ridge. And it was actually run by kind of this cult-like group of people. But um what it was is they advertised themselves as a boarding school for misbehaving children. Mm-hmm. And parents would send their children to the school. And what would happen is people would show up at these kids' houses and just kidnap them. Yeah. But they'd break into the kids' room. They'd drag them out of the house. They'd drive in the middle of the night to this location in the middle of nowhere. 
And in this school, well, I use school very lightly because it wasn't they weren't yeah. getting an education. But in this in this location, like it's so like the the rules even even before the abuse when the the abuse takes place of the kids because it was rampant with abuse. Um, the rules were so strict. Like literally, you got demerits for looking out the window. Jeez. Like if you were looking out the window, you got you got a demerit. If you were talking to somebody, you got a demerit. Um, you had to sleep with your door open, and lights were on the entire time. When it was actually time for classes, you just sat in front of a Christian homeschool computing program, and that was your education. That's messed up. Yes. Yep. And like it, it, and um, the docu series is like. These kids who graduated from the program and have tried to kind of put their lives back together after, yeah, they revisit yeah. the building in their lives now, and the building's abandoned, but they revisit it now, and they see that all the files of the abuse that they documented is still there. Like, everything <laughs> is still there untouched, and they just start going through it and remembering and reflecting on their time there. And it also gets into, because when you hear about these places and you're like, why didn't the kids tell their parents? Or it's more, if they did tell their parents, why were the parents okay with this? Yeah. And it actually gets into how the place was both brainwashing the parents and brainwashing the children. And, you know, I so think like also, parents, like, anybody who's willing to send their kids off to someplace like that rather than try to work with the kids themselves are obviously like questionable parents to begin with. <laughs> There's a yeah, real no, weirdness agree, 100%. to that, that it, it's almost this kind of hands-off approach of like, oh, someone else will fix my child because I'm not going to. So it's like, I think those people kind of want to believe that stuff. Yeah. You know, I, yeah. I always, am, well, it's, it's, I, I it's, always find that very, very objectionable that your idea is like, oh, okay, because yeah. they would have had to have seen them drag the kid out in the middle of the night. They had to be in on that. So anybody yeah. that's willing to do that yeah. is a real failure of a parent to begin I with. I know. This is, yeah. these, <laughs> honestly, these are the people. Oh, no, like, I, I agree. So you just look at them and you're like, why did you procreate? Like, why? <laughs> yeah. 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 It's like, why? We don't like, need um, your fucking genes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like actually, the 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 main girl in this one, the girl who put this documentary together, originally what happened was like her father remarried, and she mm -hmm. didn't like her stepmother, so mm -hmm. she was acting out at home, and it wasn't even doing much. She was, yeah, smoking cigarettes, and that was like, yeah. oh my god. So they sent yeah. her to a to a private school, and when she was at this private school, she got kicked out because they found her with a bottle of Mike's Hard Lemonade. And yeah. then after that one thing, she got sent to this boarding school program. And yeah. like over a Mike's Heart Lemonade, there's actually part of the documentary where she's in the abandoned building and she takes in a bottle of Mike's Heart Lemonade and she's like, all right, let's do this. <laughs> <laughs> but oh um, it, it's it's but part of it, too, is like, like, let's say, like, as the parent, like, I'm, I'm not defending the parents. I think it's awful. But it's also, too, it's like. I think people turn a blind eye to this as well because mm -hmm. one the parents were suckered out of thousands of dollars yeah like at yeah. the location in new york it was literally like thirty five hundred dollars a month to keep Dang. your kid there so like yeah. parents are paying like 75 grand while they're yeah. also allowing this place to abuse their child and yeah. like who wants to admit that you lost that kind of money and subjected your own child to that at the same time. Yeah. Like it's gross, but like nobody wants to admit that they were the sucker. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. it just further like causes more issues between everybody involved. Um, yeah, that's just so is, weird. <laughs> it, it's unreal it is, that it's it is, like, you know, people don't want to deal with the fact that they could be wrong. It, it'd be so much easier to just say I was wrong and I'm sorry than it is to dig in your heels and actually be cruel to somebody that you did yeah. that to. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's 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 a sickening it's a sickening documentary, but I also feel like it's important to watch just so more people learn about how fucking awful this this industry is. Yeah. And hopefully yeah. we can get rid of it because the fact that we pretty much have legalized places for child abuse in this country is like terrifying yeah. to me. 
you know, and it's, it's like a program. <laughs> you know, and it's interesting too, and and horrifying because it there's always been places where you can put kids if you don't like how they behave. You know, they used to be able to just put people into mental institutions very easily, and that was just something that happened. You know, and you can send kids yeah. just away anytime you don't want to, and this is just another form of really like mental institutions of like the 20th century that it's like yeah. there's a yeah. place down in west virginia and i i don't love the name of it even though that was one of the names it originally had it's called the trans allegheny lunatic asylum and they actually have like this thing and i think it's gone around social media of the reasons people got committed and like one of them was like reading novels they committed yeah. a woman yeah. for reading novels and it's like these things these things like happen that it's just you know somebody does something that someone else doesn't like and there's just a place where you can send somebody away and yeah. so it is like i think you're right that it's important to know that these things are still happening we kind of think like oh this doesn't happen anymore it still happens we we might package it up differently but it's still out there yeah oh yeah just give it like, a fancy there was this name. one like one kid and back in like 2005, when he was there, he actually led a riot. Like him and a bunch of the other boys, they were trying to close the place down. And they had a riot to like just fuck the place up and try to get the place mm-hmm. to close down. It didn't work, but because he instigated the riot, he actually got sent to jail. And he was like, mm. jail was heaven compared to what this place was. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's on Netflix. It's some real life horror, but I do think mm-hmm. it's important to to watch just because we need to be know that like these things exist in the place we live, and if we yeah. don't know about it, we can't really make any changes to try to try to fix it. But <laughs> I will say this: it's a riveting watch. Like I legit <laughs> sat for three hours yesterday, and I couldn't look away from my TV until it was done. <laughs> so. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but I will say that's it for me this week. I'm not going to get into anything else besides the fact that I understand that LeMay's obsession with Baldur's Gate 3 now. But <laughs> yeah. um, Matt, what about you? Any others? Yeah, one more. Uh, that's just uh, and it ju- it's coming out. Well, it'll be out when this episode airs, but that's uh, Joshua Hole's mouth uh, came out from Tenebris Press and Joshua Hull wrote Glorious on Shudder. I don't know if anyone's seen that, but that's the Glory Hole. Oh, I love Glorious. <laughs> yes. So he wrote, he Glorious wrote that. Glorious was so good. Uh, so this is his first uh, novella, and this is great. It's a lot of fun. It's about a uh, mouth full of teeth in the ground, and our main character, Rusty, is kind of a drifter, and he gets... Th- this mysterious man gives him a house and all this property. And when he gets on the house and all this property, he finds mouth and the note is like, Oh, you got to feed mouth. And he's a mouth <laughs> is a, can be a great friend, but you have to feed him uh, usually like a box of mice. But then every once in a while, you got to give him something a little bit more. And um, so you got that. And then you have Abigail who is a girl that lives in the town and works at the pet shop. And she's a horror movie obsessed kid. And she has been tracking this guy buying all these boxes of mice and follows him. And then realizes there's this mouth in the ground full of teeth. Uh, And then we also get the perspective of mouth who is just really hungry and likes to eat and wants to make his new friends happy and, and, and likes his new friends. And it just, it's just, it's wacky, um, but there's some really fun, like, you know, looks at, like, pasts and everything like that. And, of course, when we, you you know what they have to feed the mouth, and that's people. And uh, um, and it's a really comical way that they have to feed this giant hole in the te- uh, hole in the ground. And we also get a bit of look at kind of like a, um, gosh, I don't know, like a, not quite Charles Band, but like a, like, like a, a, movie director who makes all this like really really schlocky stuff and he owns this he he was the guy that and this not spoiler he owned that property and he's the one that gave it to rusty and um you get like a nice little look at like 60s and 70s b movie um making and bad names and how like certain producers would hold directors basically hostage and make Mm -hmm. them 
do these to- like really bad movies. And so that, that part was really fun. And you're kind of seeing Joshua's like uh, history and experience with, with uh, Hollywood and horror movies and stuff like that in there. And it's just absolutely a blast. It's, it just came out. Uh, it's it getting a lot of good praise, which is really cool to see. And I think a lot of people are digging this just because it, it, it does have a lot of humor. It's not up there with say like danger Slater humor, but it's got that humor in there. But then also you're you're dealing with this mouthful of teeth and and like what happens when it doesn't eat and all this stuff. So yeah, it, it, it's a blast. I want to talk more about it. I think we should do it on the podcast at some point. Um, so I won't won't go any deeper than that. But I, I definitely recommend checking this out. It's it's gonna get really popular really soon. So definitely get on board as soon as you can. Perfect. Honestly, I love the glorious, so I am excited to to check this out yeah it like it, that humor the humor and glorious is kind of the humor in this i mean a little bit more i would say but um yeah if you like glorious you'll really like this one what's it called again the mouth it's by joshua hole you said yep h-u-l-l all right joshua hole hole all right vitlame what about you uh my Last husband one. and i were like like we decided to find some kind of series to watch together and uh, there's been a lot of like new Korean shows been like added up on Netflix and you know you know that you, the, the Koreans are very good at doing horror series so there's this one series that we're watching now that is called The Happiness okay and um, it's it happens just after just after COVID and they mentioned COVID a lot, which is kind of fun episode. They always say like every everything that you see in the you see in the show is fictitious, and I'm like, wait, so you're saying COVID is fictitious here now? <laughs> like like all events, all events are fictitious, and I'm like, not COVID though. Maybe you want to point that out. <laughs> that happened. <laughs> no matter how many times people are trying to forget about it, this happened. <laughs> yeah. Um, so it happens after after COVID, and um, there's apparently a new virus that is attacking um, this town or city in South Korea. I can't. I think it's called Sang. It's not. It's not in Seoul, like in the in the capital for uh, for I don't know for whatever reason. But and they call it the Mad Human Disease. Okay, that's a nice name. Well, they and then finally they get a like a official name and it's like the little virus. And I'm like, yes, why don't you just call it the little virus then instead of mad human disease? <laughs> but it's a good but it's a good description of that virus because it's like similar to rabies. And mm. that people get like really like they start attacking people, but they have this like uncontrollable thirst, no matter how much no matter how much water they consume. Mm. They can't. They can't get rid of the the thirst, so they resort to drinking human blood instead. Oh yeah, that's a logical next step. Yeah. Totally yes. <laughs> but but the interesting part about this is that like after they've kind of sated themselves, they kind of go back to normal. Okay. So they like they know like they kind of like know what's happening, and they're like, oh shit, I I am consuming human blood now, but there's no. <laughs> cure for this so i guess i gotta continue doing that <laughs> and, again uh, very very logical reasoning i'm i'm totally on board yeah and it happens uh in like in this residential area in in that city like there's like huge like huge ass apartment complexes like they are inter like they are interconnected and it's basically everything that is happening like with the infection happens around there and we follow two people uh, who knew each other from high school. Uh, they decided to get married just out of convenience, just to get like access to the apartments there because apparently they're really fancy and you you need like certain points to get in there, like society points or something. I don't know. It's weird, <laughs> but apparently this is a thing in Korea though. So yeah, and um, so and they kind of get. Draw, like dragged into this because the, the woman she was scratched by an infected but she wasn't she didn't she wasn't infected by it so like she might have the 
like the key to the cure, but they don't know. But at the same time, like she doesn't want to have anything to do with it. Like she doesn't want to be like tested or anything like that. She's like, I just want to protect my house, like my apartment that I fought really hard to keep. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and uh, she and she also like feels responsible for the the attendance in the in the complex. So like she and the guy who is a police officer, they are just kind of like trying to keep everything together while infection and rapid humans just like roam around the buildings <laughs> it's really fun i do like it like there's like it, there's not it's not horror but at the same time like it's not it's fun to explore the different um tenants in the in this complex like they're whole, whole like slew of them but you also get like a good view into each of their lives and then you can like pick and choose like who who do you sympathize the most with and who, who do you really want to just be dragged around and just killed horribly in the most horrible fashion <laughs> you can imagine are you supposed to like the lady that possibly has the cure i do like her but she like uh, which is kind of like uh, typical with any kind of Korean uh, Korean series, especially if it's like even even when it's a horror or a K drama, like she has all of the uh, charm, but then also at the same time you're like you there's like there's nothing that faces you, does it? Like you have no weaknesses. Oh. Like it's kind of like yeah. a Mary Sue kind of thing. So you're like you're too perfect. Like give us a flaw. <laughs> well, I mean, <laughs> I don't know. That's one of those things, and, like, we definitely do not have to get into it on this show, but, mm-hmm. you know, that, like, the the meme that was going around, like, right around COVID about, like, oh, we now we know the person being bit by a zombie, they wouldn't tell anybody, and all that stuff is actually accurate. Um, this feels like that, too, where you're, like, if somebody had the cure to, like, COVID, but then they're saying, like, hey, I don't want you to take it from me, it's just an interesting idea. Uh, <laughs> well, the, the thing is, like, she she has no problem with having it taken from her. But if it's like they if they force her to do it, she doesn't like that. That's and, fair. And, now that yeah. part that I get. Yeah, it's like it's like the military is like they actually like forcibly removed her from the complex. And she was like, okay. "Bitch, if you just asked nicely, I would have yeah. come." All right. That okay. That 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 clears it up. Okay, good. I just thought it was one of those like no, I don't want to help I'm anybody like, kind of thing. No, she's not selfish. Like she is like she knows for like she has an inkling herself, like something's not right, but she doesn't know why. And uh-huh. like she is like in con- constant contact with one of the people who is in the in the military who's conducting this experiment. So they are all aware that like something's up, but at the same time, she's still pissed at like, hey, maybe you know, just approach me like an old human being. Yeah, that's fair. Okay. I, and that's all. That's all I wanted to know. I'm done. <laughs> all right. I, that's all, yeah. That sounds great. I have to check that out. I'm, yeah, I'm enjoying it. It's like it has a decent amount of war, decent amount of like suspension, uh, like suspense. And uh, you kind of like you you can't help but root for the <laughs> the cop guy because he's like, yeah, I'm just in it for her because I think you're interesting. So, yeah, we'll see what happens. <laughs> nice. <laughs> and Gwendolyn, do you have one last one? Yeah, nothing specific. I just want to point out that we are in Women in Horror Month. And so everybody should be celebrating women in horror. So we now do Women in Horror Month in March, which is also Women's History Month. So yeah, just be reading and watching stuff by women in horror. Yes. Nice. Yes. Oh, 100%. (laughs) And not just, don't, don't just do it to this month. All year round. Yeah, obviously, but definitely <laughs> do it this good, month. Get focus. in a good habit this month and carry it through the rest of the year. Yes. Why don't we take a turn on to um into your new novel, Gwendolyn? Yes, that sounds And great. talk about the haunting of Velkwood. Yes. Which, as we said before, this is a really great ghost story and a really great novel. I really, really enjoyed it. And I really hope our audience picks this up for you because I want to see more big Gwendolyn Keist releases. <laughs> yeah, I appreciate that. <laughs> yeah, I guess um I and I don't know if we fully uh, I, mean, I don't think we did at all, but just the very basic gist for everybody. Actually, Gwendolyn, you should let's give 
do the sales pitch. What? what, what All right. You know? sounds, <laughs> sounds good. So the haunting of Velkwood is all about a haunted neighborhood. So 20 years ago, Velkwood Street one night just turned into a ghost. The whole street is now behind this kind of ghostly veil and all of the people who were still there are stuck inside. And the only people who can cross the barrier are the three girls who escaped the night before. They went back to college. They were all about 20 years old. And the next morning they got the call that their whole neighborhood had turned into a ghost. And so now it's 20 years later and one of them has finally decided that she is going to go back and try to find her little sister who's still trapped inside. Nice. That, yes. <laughs> uh, and I, I and, I, and the concept is awesome because, and which we've said, <laughs> but I, I think I, I like, um, the the expand like you know and it's it's a it's a street but like I can still say expanse because it's not just a house um <laughs> I like the expanse of it uh because it gives mm-hmm. you as the reader more more to kind of look at and then as the the main character Talitha it gives her more um places to explore and see and, and I, I I like that uh idea just because like we've seen and I'm not disparaging any haunted house stories I love plenty of haunted house stories of but we but but we've seen it and, and I like the idea more of seeing like what happens to like a whole street and what happens to the things inside there and like um and we're for listeners we're gonna do our best not to spoil anything so like because because it is brand new and you should read it um but like i even just something little like i i and i don't know why it stuck out with me but like the bugs and the ants like especially with the pop i think the the pop can that was there yes and then uh, just and it's such a little like you know there's more happening but for i just love that idea because of just or the frog Uh, anyway (laughs) Uh, yes, there's a lot of like creepy crawly things because you know yes. neighborhoods have those things, right? Like we yeah. have those, yes. you know, they're in the earth, they're hanging around. So there's definitely a very creepy little frog who's who's hanging around, but there's a lot of bugs. I like insects. I think oh. insects are neat. I mean, just, I don't want them just, in my house necessarily, but right. like, just I to let cool. just to let you know, we don't have any of those things here in Iceland. So this freaked me out, especially the millipedes. <laughs> I love you that. Know? We don't, don't know. Don't what do you mean? Realize. What do you mean? Nice what do you mean? No, we don't have millipedes here. <laughs> do you have centipedes? Right? No. So, okay. We well, like if it, if we do, they're so freaking small that we don't notice them, and they that they don't set foot in our houses because everything is concrete. Uh, that's fair. Okay. Mm. <laughs> I, just, I didn't. So realize no, that. seeing a huge plate of millipedes, no, that did not <laughs> sit well with me. <laughs> Yay! Oh, the list is so <laughs> I mean, we we don't even have frogs here, so yeah, no. Interesting. <laughs> no, it's very boring. Come on, guys. Fair, fair. You have volcanoes. <laughs> yeah, you, you, yeah. Know, you can play. You can play with those so much. <laughs> but anyway it's just a one turn what's one time use and then you're done and then just mean you not the volcano <laughs> um yeah no so uh, anyway i it i love the, the idea i love the concept of the the street and i love that i was sort of trapped like in the 90s and i thought that was like a really cool concept and mm-hmm. the, the ghosts and just like the it f- what were uh, and this is such a rando thing, but like having the characters sort of like re- the ghosts kind of replay th- things, like especially the old lady with the frog um, saying the same things over and over. It made mm-hmm. me think of this really obscure play that I saw once, but what it like like a v- almost not quite a video game, but like those kind of characters that just say the same things over and over. But mm-hmm. I loved like the way you had it set where it felt like okay maybe they're talking to the frog but maybe they're talking to Talitha like you don't know and like again mm-hmm. not spoiling anything but like I love that because it just adds to the eeriness of like a normal street that has something eerie happening so all of it was awesome oh thank you yeah I like <laughs> the idea 
seen things kind of on repeat because I feel like a lot of times with people and with families, we can repeat patterns over and over again, that there's just certain some tradition and that's good, but sometimes it's just like you have the same conversations or you go in circles with people if you're trying to resolve anything. And so to me, it was like, well, if this whole neighborhood is stuck in the past, then let's have them just keep repeating things because they're stuck in this past and they're stuck in this loop. But many times people ghosts can kind of get stuck in loops as well. Yeah. And that was going to lead and like, you know, it, uh, cause I'm sure you've answered all these questions in other shows, but like, what was the, 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 like the crux of this? Like, what was the idea that kind of like got you into this one? Yeah. So I, I really, I hadn't done a ghost story for one of my novels necessarily. The Rust Maidens isn't, they're not really ghosts. You know, there's kind of a ghostly element of it all, but they're, they're much more corporeal than that. And my second novel was a witch novel. And my last book was, you know, Reluctant Immortals, it was Immortals and Vampires. And so I'd written ghost stories. My novelette, The Invention of Ghosts, was obviously a ghost story. But I hadn't <laughs> done a novel that was a ghost story yet. And I always love kind of taking a trope and doing something with it that I at least personally haven't seen done before. And I don't think A Haunted Neighborhood has been done. I could never really find one that it had been done necessarily, certainly not like this. And anyone who's interviewed me hasn't found one yet either. So I'm glad that it's, <laughs> if not exclusively my idea, it's definitely, yeah. you know, pretty much my idea. Heck and yeah. so that just really seemed very appealing to me to kind of take that trope and do something with it that I'd never seen before, especially because haunted houses <laughs> are something that's so, that are so common. It seemed really interesting to be like, okay, how about if there's like, way more what if there's a whole neighborhood of these haunted houses and what does that look like and what is that ecosystem because we kind of know you know we've seen haunted houses done and that's not to say i'm not going to write a haunted house story at some point too that's not like you said there's nothing wrong with a good haunted house story exactly but i i like the idea of seeing what is the dynamic like when it's not just one house when all of them are haunted and what is that like and so it was just very appealing to me to kind of go down that that road and explore that yeah so and like, this, oh, this, go on. Uh, I was say, this actually <laughs> brings up a question I was going to ask you, but it's it's kind of similar to the whole like haunted neighborhood thing. Have you ever seen a movie that was called Terrified out of Argentina? Mm-hmm. No. So know. it's actually about a haunted neighborhood. <laughs> oh no! Yeah, yeah, yeah it is. Bad yeah. One. And that's that's why I was thinking now I this to look book up, reminded look me of that a little bit. And I was like, oh, I wonder if that was like an influence on this. But it's, no. it's done a different way, but like I think nice. I think you might get something out of out of that movie after having written this book. Yeah, I have no one has brought that one up yet, so I am excited. I will definitely <laughs> check that one out. Yeah. It's if you have Shudder, it's on Shudder. Okay. But Very it's cool. about this like neighborhood in Argentina where just these like paranormal things begin happening in and they bring in these investigators to try to like figure out what's going on and it just kind of spirals out of control very cool yeah and you know other things that you know there obviously are haunted ghost towns so that's like a big neighborhood yeah. right and like <laughs> one of the other things that people have compared it to is like wandavision which is sort of like in a way its own haunted neighborhood right i don't think it yeah. builds itself yeah. as that per se but it's something that's very much separated off. I haven't seen it yet. I want to. I love Elizabeth Olsen, but like I, I maybe I shouldn't say this because some people get really offended, but I sort of lost interest in a lot of the Marvel Universe stuff a few years ago. I was really, yeah. really into it and then just kind of got fatigued on it. So I haven't seen anything <laughs> in a few years, but I would like to see one. I think I have enough backstory to understand it. So honestly, same. Like one yeah. is worth watching. I think it's it's the best Disney Plus series they've done. Yeah, yeah, yeah that, I've heard it's really good. Like I said, I, I, good, but one concept to... of it, I know what it's about, so that's really cool. And the other thing I get the comparison to is Annihilation, which I also have not seen or oh. nor read. But you know, it's like you know that idea of this area that is cordoned off that you can't get into, and yeah. so yeah. yeah, and Silent Hill comes up sometimes as well, which I have seen. I never played the game. I haven't seen the movie in years. But like again, that's more of like a haunted town, right, rather than a haunted neighborhood. Yeah. But yeah, yeah, well. And now that you mention it, yeah, I, I could like I think WandaVision can be like a good subtle comparison to it. Uh yeah. Specific, like yeah, also, I, would, I would agree with that. 
because uh, and where like and I was gonna ask too but like to kind of lead into that question is just that because it is like WandaVision and yours it's like you know when you see a haunted stuff a lot even talking about like Silent Hill and all these things you know like the ta- the town's all decrepit and it's all scary and spooky but like you do like a really good job of making it this like somewhat normal looking neighborhood which I'll get to in a second but like you know I mean like it, it's it none of the houses are like completely falling apart because it's trapped in this kind of like time thing um it, it, but <laughs> I was gonna say it like is uh, I love the idea of you making it like one of those almost um planned neighborhoods like a like a I, I can't think of the word yes. now off the top of it but I like that and I don't know if that was where that was going with it but I just that idea of that because I have quite a few of those around here in Michigan and and it does feel mm-hmm. that way where it's like even as soon as they make it it's kind of out of date <laughs> and you make a reference to that yeah um so I, th- I don't know if that's like a thing that pops up around your area a lot or <laughs> like where that was kind of coming from yeah you know it's uh I-, I knew people who lived in those types of places and I they were interesting. I, I just lived in a small town, you know, on a street and it wasn't a planned community. And I do think planned communities have this kind of unnatural feel to them because normally houses get built, you know, when and where there are jobs or people are drawn to something as opposed to like, oh, we're going to deliberately build this neighborhood. So there's something kind of artificial about them. And they're yeah. often very much they kind of keep out outsiders. The idea of it is you're an insider, you're an outsider. And I really like the idea of having this thing that deliberately tries to separate itself from other places. And yeah, and they do often get dated very quickly. So there's this kind of haunted quality to many of these places very fast because, you know, whatever it is, the trends of home ownership, I guess, move on. I I don't know. I (laughs) I find that weird. I, I don't really understand. A lot of that. I don't understand the competition about houses at all. I yeah. never have. I'm like, I, I have a house and I'm happy that I have a roof. Like I'm not yeah. somebody who's like, I yeah. must be competitive in my house. I'm like, no, I just don't want it to leak or have bugs in it. <laughs> <laughs> and I live in the country, so you're you're gonna have at least some bugs. So maybe I should say a minimal amount of bugs. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not so some bugs are our friends. Like like spiders are, are our friends. They kill the critters that walk into our houses and stuff like that. Sometimes. Other times <laughs> they just sit there and they let the bugs fly around. And I'm always like, man, I want That's... you here for a reason. <laughs> it's like, you're not doing your job. Uh <laughs> Fit LeMay, I feel like you might have had some questions and we've been talking a lot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's fine. Uh, yeah, I, I said in the beginning that I, uh, like, one thing that, like, kept running through my head as, as I started reading the story was that it reminded me a lot of the show From. What show? Right. From, which oh, from? is, yeah. Okay. Yeah, like it's, I, oh, it's actually, in, I didn't think about that, but I, I see the I see why you, th- you thought of that now. That little yeah, bit. it's giving me that kind of vibe, because... Uh, well, you haven't seen it, have Gwendolyn, have you? No. It's it's about like a town in the middle of nowhere, and mm-hmm. these people just kind of stumble into it, like random people just from from all over the states. They just mm-hmm. stumble into this town, and then they just can't get out. They're stuck. Okay. Yeah. And there are some creatures in there that basically roam around that place and they are hungry and they want those people mm-hmm. and this like the the majority of the the series is like them trying to like the the sheriff trying to well, or like the appointed sort of sheriff he's not really a sheriff he used to be a military man uh, trying to decipher like how, what is happening and like why are they stuck and why does it always keep getting more people in mm-hmm and uh, it kind of gave me the same thing, like with Talitha being, you know, she's the one who got out, but the street is still calling for her. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. And uh, I, yeah. I love that. I love that kind of like haunting thing, like this kind of like escaped destiny that you can't really escape from. Yeah. 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 That's something I think about a lot of 
how much, you know, how much is our own destiny ours to decide and how much of it is being decided by the world or by the people in our lives or by our past. And that's something that there's kind of always this, this push and pull in a lot of my work about those things. Yeah. I also really like the, the way that you went like kind of like in an in, in, like unconventional style when it comes to, you know, describing the hauntings. Mm-hmm. Uh, like for me, like it, it wasn't like, you know, you saw a shadow and suddenly like someone appeared behind you or something like that. It wasn't like that. Like these, it felt like the, the atmosphere atmosphere that you kind of brought forth to me when Tal that went into the neighborhood for the first time. Like I loved how stagnant it was. Yeah. Yeah. Because for me, I find that really, really horrifying. Yes. If everything yes. is if everything is stacked and and just everything just is just kept in its place doesn't move forward and that really really frightens me and that's yeah. like the, that's yeah, the kind that, of haunt, yeah. that's the kind of haunting that like really have to fresh yeah that is honestly one of like my biggest fears like as a human being is stagnation and is the idea of not moving forward and unfortunately there's a lot of people you know kind of from my past that have been in my life that I feel have, have very much stagnated that like I could go and like, you know, see somebody that I used to know 20 or 30 years ago, you know, grew up with or whatever. And it's like, nothing has changed. And, you know, it's the same problems over and over again, and nobody is doing anything to fix them. And I actually find that to be one of the most horrifying things I can think of is the idea that people don't move forward, that, that they don't move forward in any way in their lives. And it's just this constant cycle of the exact same problem over and over again. So to me, that that's kind of like the greatest existential horror is just the existential <laughs> horror of just living your life that never changes and never improves. That That's so scary to me. Yeah. I also like, like I, don't, I don't think you described it as grief horror, did you? No, but I mean, that that's a good, yeah, that's a good description of it though, yeah. Yeah, I definitely caught a lot of grief in it. Like, and it's like yeah. latent grief and a lot of like unexplained grief, and um, just also just you know, kind of like unforgiving grief. Yeah, yeah, that's a good that's yeah. a good way of describing it. Absolutely, yeah. Because uh, you definitely see a lot of it through Talitha's Talitha's um, relationship with her mother. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, definitely. Yeah. And uh, it was just heartbreaking to hear, and or not just not just to hear, just to read, uh, yeah. because you know I, I think a lot of the people would probably be a little bit annoyed at Talitha for not doing anything, just mm. for you know for her inaction basically. Yeah. But yeah, but as you said, like at the beginning of like in your dedication, you said for the survivors, and like Talitha is a survivor, and it's just so hard. You can't really ex- like let people explain like why they couldn't do this because it's so hard and it's so different for each and every survivor yeah Yeah. something i brought up at my lawn i had my launch party for this earlier this week and something i talked about is the fact we don't really hold space in everyday life for people who have really bad traumas we don't have a place where people can easily talk about these things there's not like you know, I made the joke that like, you're not going to go into work on Monday morning and start unloading your grief on the person who's just trying to heat up their coffee. They're just wanting to get through the day at work, you know? And so it's, it's an odd thing because I understand why at times there's not space held at certain points or certain places because there's other things that need to be done. But I don't think we make enough room in life for people to say, well, okay, if I'm struggling, it's because XYZ happened to me as a child and I don't have, maybe I didn't develop the social skills that I needed because nobody was there. Or maybe I, you know, I'm still dealing with this grief or I have a lack of a support system. A lot of people who have very good support systems within their families or within their neighborhoods, you know, it, it's it's hard for them to understand how people can sort of struggle so much. But when you see it's like, okay, not only does someone maybe not have a good support network, maybe they're still in touch with their family that's still being abusive in ways, even once they're an adult. We sometimes yeah. think like, oh, the abuse is going to stop once you're no longer a child. But that's not true. That's absolutely not true. You hear of a lot of family dynamics where the abuse continues, either yes. in the same form or a different form. Mm-hmm. And so I just don't think that there is space held for that. 
And it's like, and I agree, you know, it's easy to see Talitha in this novel as being someone that up until the points of the novel really hasn't done a lot with herself. She's really struggled to get by and survive. But, you know, part of what I was trying to explore with this book was this idea that, you know, sometimes that's a lot for someone. Sometimes even Mm -hmm. being able to kind of get through a day can be a huge amount of struggle and and can be a real success just being able to do that and being able to to exist. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, I I totally get that. And I also think it's funny, like when you mentioned like with, uh, you know, some a lot of people have like a whole neighborhood as a support system and a whole like a lot of families as a support system. It's funny because you could have actually kind of took that and reversed it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like, like, for example, like you, you've heard of the phrase, it takes a village. Yeah. In yeah. this case, yeah. that is what happened to Brett. Yes. Yeah. yeah. It yes. took a village to actually allow her abuse to continue and nobody did anything. Yeah. yeah. That's a good point. Like the idea of it yeah. takes a village, you know, in a good way, but it can also take a village in a bad way to allow things to continue going on and nobody yes. does anything. Yes. Yeah. But it happens like the past happens in the 80s, right? Uh, 80s, 90s, yeah. I think everything disappears around the year 2000, I think, or 2002. Yeah, Sometimes yeah. But at, the, yeah. but at the same time, like, I I get it because, you know, in especially, like, in this kind of secluded neighborhood, um, this kind of, like, homophobia is yeah. definitely, you know, keen to be rampant in these kind of yeah. areas. Yeah. So, yeah, this, yeah. like, I... As much as it angered me, I still like, yeah, this is this is something that definitely exists at that time. <laughs> yeah. 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 Even still exists in many areas now, especially yeah. in America. I mean, I don't, you know, in, in other countries, we're not we're definitely not the only ones that still have a lot of rampant homophobia. And we've improved a lot since the 90s in America. I mean, it, it's actually kind of stunning the the amount of progress, you know, the the, the general public has made when you look at opinions of same-sex marriage from like the mid 90s when it was like almost nobody was like pro same-sex marriage to now and I think it's like 70 percent of Americans are like totally okay with same-sex marriage that's a a huge difference from like I think it was like 20 percent in the mid 90s that's a big shift in only about a generation or two so yeah that's at least heartening to me and anytime I think about because sometimes I can get pretty disheartened with the direction of this country but anytime <laughs> i think like things never get better i always remember that that better that's gotten better since i was a kid and that that's a huge thing to me especially because i dealt with obviously a lot of homophobia biphobia because i'm bisexual and you know mm. i didn't even come out publicly oh, wait did we lose everybody uh, i think I've, no i i, I, I think can still hear you it's nice Okay. For me to think that it's it's easier now. It's not easy to be queer in America, but it's easier in many cases. And there's more resources and there's more support. And that that's very heartening and very positive. Yeah. 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 Uh, <laughs> did, uh, I, I have a question for you, uh, Gwendolyn. Um, okay. Did you, it, I think you said in the um, in the acknowledgments that you this was like a really personal and a difficult book for you to write, right? Yeah. Yeah. But did you feel a little bit of catharsis after after writing it? You know, some, some. And the big thing with this book more than anything was sort of finished when I finished writing it. I'm like, I've got a lot of work to do personally to be able to Mm. kind of move through this and fully process what I sort of did with this. Because, you know, when I started writing it, I didn't really know that that's what I was writing about. It really evolved as the book went along. And then I was like, oh, okay, so I'm dealing with this now. And then at when I finished writing it, There was some catharsis, but the catharsis has more come with me sort of dealing with it over the last, I mean, I sent it to my editor not quite two years ago, but close to two years ago, and really spent, you know, a lot of the last two years processing it and being like, okay, like I I have a much safer place in my life now to deal with this. And Mm -hmm. so it's, it's really, it's really time. And so, yeah, I mean, I... I said even before the book came out that I've never written anything that's changed me in my personal life and kind of the direction of my personal life as much as this book. And I doubt that I ever will again. You know, I don't think I don't suspect that any other book I write will kind of have the kind of sort of ground shaking effect that this really had on me of realizing like, okay, like I I have to process these things now I have to or it's going to be less of a life for the rest of my life. So that was 
that that was a big thing for a book to do. But I, I remember yeah. saying to my yeah. husband, I'm like, you know, this this book has already made such a huge difference in my life. So it's nice that people it is resonating with people. That's always good, too. <laughs> but even before that, I'm like, you know, this this book had to be written for me personally. So, yeah, that's yeah. nice. Yeah. As for the as as for the characters, like, did you like have in mind when you were creating Brad, Talitha, and Grace, and then Enid? Mm-hmm. Did you like have like the craft in mind, or <laughs> or yeah, um... that's come up a couple times. And so, like, you know, originally, I think Enid sort of evolved and sort of emerged not right away. So initially, I was thinking three. And then Enid sort of popped up and she's, I, I adore her. She's not in the book a ton. It's not really her story per se. So I have a very Enid-like character in a book I'm writing right now because I was kind of like, I feel like I had this kind of, you know, idea of, oh, I really do want to know. I want to explore a character like this a little bit more because she's very ethereal and very different than the other girls. But mm-hmm. I didn't necessarily have the craft in mind because originally it was only supposed to be three of them. And so that kind of just evolved naturally as as the book as the book went on. But would you say like the influence is maybe like the dynamic that of um, the friendship that you can see from like the Stephen King books? You know, there's That's always the like other... there's always like the four 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 boys, and one of them is always a little bit particular, peculiar. <laughs> You know, that's another one I think just it's kind of I think so many of us are influenced by Stephen King. This is somebody else brought up and said that it gave off it vibes. And I, I very much agree with that. It was not a planned thing. But as I was writing, I'm like <laughs> people are definitely going to say it. And I realized that about halfway through. And I'm like, that's fine. That's completely fine. It wasn't <laughs> conscious. But I think because Stephen King is so part of the zeitgeist and even the craft is so part of the zeitgeist and I. I do think that those things definitely crept in there, whether I whether it was conscious or not. I do think mm-hmm. that that influence definitely hangs over it to some extent. Yeah, yeah no, I I'm not say, sure. And I think people will appreciate it when they see it because they like seeing these kind of connections. I, I think so. I yeah, because like at first, be influenced by something I'm, I'm not just, consciously being influenced by, but I'm like, that's fine. Nobody's going to be angry about it. Like you said, <laughs> you don't enjoy that kind of stuff. <laughs> I was going to say, I've been listening to the It audiobook on my commute to work in the morning, and like, I definitely got the connection reading this mm. between my It commutes. <laughs> but, um, It commutes, I love it. With, That's with, great. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but similar to what Vintner was asking with the characters, like, so you said there was originally like three characters. What were the three characters that you came up with? originally we're in there. so Brett, Talitha can... and Grace so those were the three that I really started with that I knew right from the first chapter were going to be those like three that had you know escaped the neighborhood and you know had dealt with it in very different ways you know and this isn't this isn't given too much of a spoiler because we learned this pretty early on Talitha is stagnated and is just sort of getting by kind of living day to day Grace has pretty much fallen apart we find that out just the extent of it as it goes on Meanwhile, Brett, since it happened, has completely thrived and is doing very well, very professionally successful. You know, she came from not a lot of money, now has a lot of money, but he's also not like a jerk about money. Because like I was saying earlier, I don't really like rich people, but like (laughs) we get the impression like she's helping to revitalize neighborhoods. She's taking like empty buildings. And I think I actually describe her as like the human incarnation of spirit Halloween because she's actually taking these empty buildings and turning them into community centers and art galleries. And so like, I wanted it to not just be like, oh, she's a rich jerk, but like, this is somebody who's figured out how to really build a life that actually gives back and she can thrive too. And my idea with, with it was how much I wanted to explore the different ways people process trauma. Some people completely fall apart. Some people barely get by, but manage to. And then some people figure out a way to really push past what's happened and, and thrive. And I wanted to explore all those different aspects. And I also think it's interesting, and I don't think I've talked about this before in talking about this book, in that whatever, however you manage to deal with trauma, people will be, there's kind of a mean narrative about it. If you fall apart, like Grace did, it's like, wow, you really can't deal with anything, can you? 
And if you kind of just barely get by day to day, like Talitha does, it's kind of a similar thing of like, wow, you really didn't thrive. But then if you have somebody like Brett, who manages to completely thrive, completely turn their life around and do well, then it's like, well, the abuse must not have been that bad. You yeah. couldn't possibly do that if, if, if it was so bad. And so no matter what happens to you, no matter how you sort of process trauma and abuse, there's always a narrative to minimize it. So it's like, not only do we not hold space for it, we can, we actually actively have these scripts that we use in society to minimize what happens and to have this way of being like, you should be doing better or you should be able to thrive. Oh, but if you are thriving, then you must not have been that bad. And those are all just terrible, terrible narratives. Yeah. Well, and I'm glad you kind of brought it up because that was the one thing like I was, and especially a little bit earlier, you were talking about it too. And I was thinking that with the three of them and having that space and that challenge because you show like they Brett and tell like they, 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 uh, like they have conversations, you know, the Christmas card every year and, and, and the houses Mm -hmm. and and everything like that. There was, I think it was like a two year span where they weren't really talking. Um, I could be wrong, but like, there's like a period of time up to the point of the book. Um, yeah, but like thinking about and exactly what you were just saying that like this, this idea of even even the three of them having dealt with this trauma and and the challenge of how you personally internalize the trauma and deal with it with the other people that have dealt with mm-hmm. it you know like mm-hmm. you can not digging into anything other for personal reasons but uh, having like even a family that's dealt with that and it it's that idea of like you everyone in that family dealt with that trauma differently. And like, you like, and everything you just said is like spot on where you're like, well, this person's doing well because I don't know the trauma, like they weren't there for some of it. Or like this person is like, like the gray stuff was just like, like, I totally can see that. And even like when they get to the house or they get to a place Mm -hmm. and see how it's still trapped in a certain time. And like, I like, Mm -hmm. (laughs) Mm-hmm. <laughs> I can see like I I know that situation and like mm-hmm. um mm-hmm. and so it just I I when you had talked about it a little bit earlier it just like really struck home that idea of even if you've dealt with the same trauma with three people and how they handle it differently and how they handle mm-hmm. it with each other differently mm-hmm. I mean like they basically just they tell it that really tries with grace but like you kind of have this idea of like well they stop talking to her for a long time and and like when they do see her they're like oh I mean like Brett's like let's get out of here and stuff like that and it's just it's really (laughs) like (laughs) like this fascinating kind of look at it that I didn't really think about until you just brought it up so it's very nice (laughs) Um, but yeah I just like that uh, I just I thought that that like is such a interesting way we even talking about like having a space to deal with like trauma and like that and how personal Mm -hmm. you deal with it yourself compared to somebody else who was maybe in that same house or that same situation it's just Mm -hmm. it's a fascinating thing that I've always kind of had a soft spot for so um yeah but I really like this <laughs> yeah no no I, I, I was <laughs> well, well, I'll, I'll, I'll turn back to my normal <laughs> self and not the real self <laughs> <I was> like, <laughs> you 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 have the real Matt slip in there for a second there. yeah we won't we won't dig into those 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 places too much but no, I really I, I, I keep that the better I'm joking <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> Lots and lots. <laughs> um, but no, I really, uh, yeah. Such, I, I, I think you an interesting point, though, because I think so many of us have some kind of trauma. Some Something has happened yeah. to so many of us, maybe several somethings, right? But like, and and again, we don't talk about it because there isn't space to kind of safely talk about it. And there's a lot yeah. of reasons. Sometimes people are still alive that don't want us to talk about it for yeah. whatever reason, or we don't want to hurt other people by talking about it. And yet it's, you know, something that, again, we don't hold that space for it. And I think that that's just yeah. really sad. There there needs to be more for that, for people to be able to process it. Because some people, you know, we're talking about, you know, these characters that maybe struggle and, and are mostly their own worst enemy. But there's a lot of people out there who get angry. 
who get angry, yeah. who get mean, who carry on cycles of abuse, you know? And yeah. so it's like, by not talking about it and not dealing with it, we actually continue to allow it to just keep repeating, you know, right down the line, right down the generations, rather than dealing with it, rather than bringing it out into the light and saying, hey, this is a problem and this needs to be dealt with. We allow it to continue going on. And so it is, it's frustrating to me because it feels like, you know, these are, these are truths, they're emotional truths, but oftentimes there's actual facts involved of, okay, this happened on this day to these people, you know, and it, it does seem strange to me how much we hide those things and how much we, we don't talk about them and that allows them to just continue going on. Yeah. No, yeah. It's, it, it's also, like, oh, go on. I was going to say, like, even speaking about that as well, because that's something your book, this book, like, made me think about, too, is also on top of that fucked up docuseries that I watched. Yeah. Um, was just, like, all the trauma that we carry around with us on, like, a daily basis. Yeah. And I'm sure, like, most people have experienced at least one traumatic event in their life that mm -hmm. they carry mm -hmm. with them every single day. Mm -hmm. But I feel yeah. younger people, because I work in the mental health field. Well, mm -hmm. I'm a teacher, but I teach in a mental health facility. Um, okay. And I feel like younger people are kind of more trying to break the cycle and talk yes. more about these issues. And I feel like yes. books like this and people being more willing to talk, and even my friends and I, let, let our real selves slip out and talk about the, these traumas that we've experienced. And I feel like it's creating healthier people in the long term. Yes. That we're yes. finally take looking at these cycles of abuse. And we're looking at these traumas yeah. and we're looking at how these have affected us and trying to break, break these cycles, which I think yes. this novel is kind of a good meditation on the idea of like this town, the haunted town also being, kind of stagnated and stuck in a cycle in a sense that like what's going on is breaking the cycles, not for only like what's happening under the veil, but for the characters that are involved with this as well. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. And I do, I think you're, I think you're so spot on with that. I think, I think, a, I think some of the, and I'm not trying to take credit for this because I am a millennial, but I do think millennials <laughs> are kind of one of the first generations to really start dealing with the idea of like family being optional rather than family being obligatory. I think yeah. older generations, even Gen X to a large degree, and I've read articles saying that this is something that it really is this place between Gen X and millennials where we started to really see this of like, you don't have to go along with family just because they're there. They're not an obligation. You can cut off contact if it's a toxic situation, if there was abuse. And Generation Z, even more so. I mean, like you said, your younger people right now are way more likely to talk about it, way more likely to acknowledge abuse and way more likely to walk away from things. And there's still a lot of societal you know, stigma about walking away from family. But I'm estranged from a decent bit of my family. And it's not a it's not a decision I regret. You know, it's it came after years of trying to work on a lot of problems and explaining where I was coming from and saying this is how this hurt me and this is why this isn't mm -hmm. good and you know being treated like this kind of family scourge over it and it's like okay then then I can just opt out of these dynamics because yeah. they don't serve any positive purpose and I think that that's really powerful to be at a time when people are saying hey I'm not going to be part of this family if this is horrible and I'm unhappy here and this isn't good for me or I'm afraid. I think it's so important to just walk away from anyone in your life that acts like that and including and probably more than anyone else family because family can hold such a thrall over us because they're like often that first relationship we have is with our family and so those dynamics yep. are very easy to fall back into. So I think it's important to, to say you know if you need to walk away from things and walk away and I think that there's a lot of power in that. Yeah. Oh, I, I, I agree 100%. And I feel like this this book's also a really good commentary dealing with that as well. But even speaking, like, one of my friends recently had to go no contact with, with their mother. Mm -hmm. And um, I was with them the whole time. I looked over, like, the text message you're going to send out. I helped them with the plan and everything. And I'm like, listen, mm -hmm. like, this is what you got to do. Like, we're, you're, you're, you don't owe your mother anything like this is your yep. life and you got to do what's best for you at this point now. Yeah. 
Yeah. And there, and again, there's really not a lot of space held for that because, you know, especially with parents, there's just this idea of, like you said, like people act like you owe them something and you're right. You don't, you do, you don't owe anybody anything in life and they don't owe you anything, especially once you're an adult, like once you're an adult, like, you know, hopefully people can stay in relationships with their families. That's ideal in that if it's positive and it's a nurturing environment, but if it's not, it's important to get away from those situations. Oh, I, I agree a hundred percent. You gotta look, gotta look out for yourself more than anything else, mm-hmm. because that's what's the most important in life. Yeah, absolutely. Wow. Well, this this got this. I feel like the conversation took topics. a very dark turn. We, we need to have something fun. Let's go back to talking about the bugs. Getting to the depth of, <laughs> of, of the, the trauma that this book is really about. <laughs> it is. It is. But I feel that's what makes successful horror. Like, successful mm. horror is something that's going to make us think or reflect about something in our own life. And, like, yeah. mm-hmm. and I, I feel like just that being an element of the story, I think, is important to making the story successful. Because, like, I mean, a story about a haunted neighborhood is is a cool story, but it's really what is in the meat of the story? What is the story really Mm -hmm. trying to get at is kind of Mm -hmm. how it's going to be remembered and how it's going to really kind of be cemented as it goes on further. Yeah. Yeah. Which I think is some more kind of important things to look at, but on the, on the surface, it sounds like a fun, spooky neighborhood horror story. And then you start (laughs) reading it and it's like, Oh, this is, this is trauma. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. There's some cool fun stuff though too. So I don't I don't want to make there it is, sound like there's, there's absolutely cool fun no stuff. fun stuff. Bugs. No, some, there is some fun stuff. Bugs, frogs. And if if you like <laughs> if you like creepy crawlies, there's a lot of creepy crawlies in this book. What I really <laughs> liked is that you like and it's like I don't the best way to describe it is like you hit us with some awesome reveals like I don't know, every couple of pages give or take. <laughs> oh, yeah. But like which I, I think is like a really neat, like, I think that's like a really good, so talking about more positive, <laughs> more other things, but like, <laughs> I just really dug that because like you're going through it and you're like, oh shit, this happened. And then you go a little bit further and you're like, oh damn, what? <laughs> and so like, I was, I'm like sitting there reading it and I was just like, oh wait, what? This just happened? Because like, you know, you have certain thoughts as you're going through it of certain characters mm-hmm. that certain things happen to. And then like, things get revealed and you're like, Oh wait, what? So that was super cool. <laughs> <laughs> so people will dig that for the like bam moments. They'll, they'll get it. They'll, they'll, you'll get it. <laughs> <laughs> but no, this is awesome. Um, I, I know this just came out and so it's probably not fair to ask, but you did say you're working on something else. Yeah, I'm working on both a novella and a novel right now. So hopefully we'll have both of those done in the next few months. The the novella is getting very close to being done. So I'm very, very excited about that. So yeah, so definitely new books, hopefully on the horizon. And the publishing works slow, so probably not for another year or two, but, you know, out there eventually. And I hope to do another collection at some point as well. My first collection came out like seven years ago now. I'd like to do another one. I've written a lot of short fiction between then and now. So hopefully, hopefully. Yeah. I saw you're, you're in the, started, clown, the, the clown anthology coming out. Yes. Yes. Very excited about that. Very excited. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> Never written a clown I, story I saw, before. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> There's always a first. Honestly, like, <laughs> right. I will say, I remember when the Rust Maidens first came out. That was when you first came on my radar. I was hearing about this mm-hmm. collection called the Rust Maidens. And I was yeah. like, oh, this sounds interesting. And instant yeah. fan. Just bam. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Mine was well, pretty thank you. Thank you. <laughs> a pre Mary's, that, that's a good one, too. <laughs> yeah, that was my first, like, standalone book. So that was a novella. That was my first novella. Yeah, it was my second book, but my first standalone. Because my first book was The Collection, and Her Smile Will Untether the Universe, and then Pretty Mary's, and then my first novel, The Rest Maiden. So, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I can't remember. I think you were on This Is Horror, maybe. Uh, you were on something, and it brought up Pretty Mary's, and I was like, sweet. So I picked that up, and then I was hooked. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> thank you. I, I, it's on my shelf, signed by you, in fact. <laughs> oh, yay. 
Well, awesome. So it came well, out this week. Say, Everybody should read it, right? Yes. Haunting of Belkwood yes. just came out on March 5th. So it's making the rounds. It's available widely in bookstores. So, yeah. Awesome. And it's definitely, it's definitely a really great, really great horror book. So our, if you're listening to this and you haven't bought it yet, like fix that now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> fix, fix that now. But no, it's, it's seriously, it's a really great book and I hope it's a big success for you. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. And thank you for having me on. This was great. Oh, thank you. Oh, no problem. Any Anytime. Thank you for coming. And where can our listeners get in touch with you, Gwendolyn? I'm on Instagram and Facebook. Look me up, Gwendolyn Keist. And I also have my website, GwendolynKeist.com. And I have an active blog. And so those are the main places you can find me. You can also sign up for my newsletter. I do Ooh. not spam you. I do not send it out all the time. But you can get updates from me through there as well. Nice. I think you use Substack. Not yet. I don't. I, I might at some point. I'm not sure, gotcha. but not yet. And Vitlame, where can Alyssa get in touch with you? Uh, they can get in touch with me on Instagram at Fangs at and Lights, and also on Twitter when I where I occasionally post just a, kind of like a writing updates at Vitlame S. I also have my own website vitlamemistauthor.com. And thank you, Gwendolyn. I really need to work on updating my newsletters. So yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I might I might have those soon. <laughs> <laughs> and Matt, what about you? Yeah, well, I guess first thing, because I am absolutely terrible at promoting myself. I have my book, uh, And Out Come the Toys, is coming out uh, the 13th. So it should be out when this airs uh, from Unnerving Books. And uh, it's my ode to Willy Wonka in 90s punk. Um, and you can find me on Twitter at uh, Brandenburg DM and my website, matt brandenburg.com. Perfect. Well, you can follow me on Instagram at Rudy53088. You can also follow me on Blue Sky under my name, Richard Gerlach. And this week, because I really want to start just doing better at using social media, <laughs> I am relaunching the Abyss Twitter or hey. Abyss X. And I'm going to actually turn my Instagram into half my own posting and half Abyss promotions. Oh, that'd be so nice. So you can follow Staring to the Abyss with, on uh, X. With at into staring, which I still think is the worst and best handle I could have given this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, <laughs> when it comes this back, there's gonna be a lot of porn bots. <laughs> <laughs> but this is Richard Girl. Uh, so yeah. Keep staring. <laughs>